Welcome to you all to this conversation with Dr. Francis Collins. Francis Collins, as I think many of you know, is a physician geneticist noted for his landmark discoveries of disease genes and his previous leadership of the International Human Genome Project, which culminated with the completion of a finished sequence of the human DNA instruction book. Dr. Collins currently serves as a senior investigator in the intramural program of the National Human Genome Research Institute, pursuing genomics research on type two diabetes and a rare disorder of premature aging called progeria. Dr. Collins was appointed by President Barack Obama as the 16th director of the National Institutes of Health, where he oversaw the work of the world's largest supporter of biomedical research. His tenure spanned an unprecedented three presidential administrations Dr. Collins was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in November of 2007 and received the National Medal of Science in 2009. In 2020, he was elected as a foreign member of the Royal Society in the UK and was also named the 50th winner of the Templeton Prize. And with that, please welcome Dr. Francis Collins. Hi, Francis, how are you? Good, Brian, how are you doing? It's been a while. It has been a while, it's great to see you. And uh, thanks for joining us in this conversation. And, and just to give a sense, are you in DC? Or are you in Washington, DC at the moment? I'm just outside. I'm in Chevy Chase, Maryland, in my home office, uh, joining you here on a Saturday night. But hello to Brisbane. Hello to Australia. Glad to be part of your part of the World Science Festival, even as we all hope that someday, before too much longer, we'll actually be able to be together in person. Yeah, that would be fantastic. We also have people joining us since this is, you know, online. We've got people joining us. I had a list of countries just a moment ago flashed up. India, North Carolina, which isn't quite a country, Calgary, <laughs> Minnesota, <laughs> Pakistan, Texas Oregon. you might have to debate about, but North Carolina. Yeah, right, North exactly. Carolina. I think that uh, <laughs> we'll leave that we'll leave that debate for later on. But um, I wanted to begin with just giving the audience a sense of of your background, which um, you know, it was a little bit unusual. I, I read once that you described your parents as, quote, doing the 60s thing, but prematurely, I think it was. They did it in the 1940s. So, so what exactly did that mean for a youngster such as yourself growing up? Um, yeah, it was a very unusual way to get started. <laughs> by the way, Brian, I should say I am also now uh, asked by the president of the United States to be his acting science advisor. So I have a new job. Yes, so congratulations on that. <laughs> yeah, and thank you. And so I must must declare here at the beginning of all this, I am speaking <laughs> from my personal perspective and not as a representative of the U.S. government, in case anybody wanted. Okay, um, so yeah, I grew up on a small farm. Uh, about three hours from here in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, a beautiful part of the country. My dad was a folk song collector who had done a lot of things with musicology in, a, in the previous decades, and a lot of his collected songs are in the Library of Congress. Oh, really? and, and yet, uh, after the war, he and my mom moved to this uh, farm, 95 acres with no indoor plumbing, and raised four boys, of which I'm the youngest and also started a summer theater in a grove of oak trees up above our farmhouse, which I'm glad to say uh, has been in continuous operation uh, despite COVID uh, for more than 60 years. Wow. And it's become quite a wonderful way uh, for the communities in the Shenandoah Valley to get together. So I was raised surrounded by interesting people who wanted to talk about Shakespeare or philosophy or music especially music. My dad was a classical violinist who became a fiddle player after spending some time in West Virginia working for Eleanor Roosevelt. So mm -hmm. it was a very eclectic kind of way to grow up. And my mom taught all four of us brothers at home until she got tired of it. Uh, and not because she had any religious interest at all. <laughs> she did not, but because she thought she was a better teacher than the public schools. And I think she was right. So, Brian, I had this amazing experience of figuring out that learning was fun because that's what my mother made it to be. Yeah, you know, I mean, lesson if you can, plans, everything was a little chaotic. Like, what's interesting today? Let's study that. I mean, that's the way to do it. I mean, I try to get that idea across to my kids, and I think I'm not all that successful at doing it. I mean, it's hard 
for kids to really see learning in that light. But maybe if you if you haven't gone to school initially, maybe it's just as part of life. Maybe that's the secret, you know. You know, and that's the way it was for me. Uh, she was very gifted. We would study mathematics uh, sometimes for several days on end, just mathematics because it was interesting. And then kind of hit a wall and like, okay, I'm frustrated. Let's do something else. Okay, let's study history here. Let's read Charles Dickens and see what we can learn about literature. Or, you know, let's let's really see what we could learn about the weather. <laughs> My right. was capable of bringing all of those things to the table in a way that made it seem like fun. And you never felt like, oh, this is a drill and I've got to learn something just because somebody told me to. It's like, I'm yeah. curious because she's helping me become curious. And I carry that with me today. Yeah, I, that, 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 that's the ideal way. You know, and a few years ago, by the way, I don't even know if it was a few years any longer because my sense of timing, mean, I think like everybody else's, is completely off because of the last couple of years. But you and I were on a bus. We, we must have been at some conference together. I cannot remember what it was. But you were a few rows in front of me on this bus filled with scientists, and I was sort of half asleep. But then I started hearing you talking about quantum mechanics and wave functions, and like my ears couldn't help but perk up. I was not trying to listen in on your conversation. But somewhere in your education, you got driven toward science. And, 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 and I gather you spent quite a lot of time learning about physics and physical chemistry and, and so forth. What, when did that happen? Well, I did end up going to public school a little later on. Uh, my mom kind of reached the end of her rope here with these four boys. And we moved in town where the public schools were actually pretty good. And, and I'm, I can't say enough about how a really good public school can inspire uh, kids about science. It was a 10th grade chemistry teacher, John House, that got me to see that science was something I want to spend my life on. This is like so exciting, so interesting. It's like a detective story. You have these tools and you can figure out how nature works. And why wouldn't you want to put yourself into that? Absolutely, completely. And I love math. So I went off to the University of Virginia. I majored in chemistry, but the part of chemistry I liked the most uh, was the part that was closest to math. So it was physical chemistry. It was really physics and went on to get a PhD at Yale in what was called uh, physical chemistry. But most of my courses were in the physics department. And my, my PhD dissertation was semi-classical theory of vibrationally inelastic scattering. So there you go. It was all done with some pencil and paper and a lot of boxes of Fortran cards running up and down the hill to the Yale Computer Center to try to see if I could calculate collisions between protons and hydrogen gas and come up with something that looked like a reasonable outcome solely based on quantum theory. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I'm, I am definitely old enough. When I was a kid, I was doing all my computer program with stacks of Fortran cards. I'd be running down to NYU on Saturday mornings, then you get one card wrong, you have to wait another hour to run. Exactly. You know, it's kind of crazy back then. Um, so, so ultimately, after that PhD, you of course shifted more toward the biological sciences, and we're going to get to your profoundly important work on the Human Genome Project in just a moment. But I, I did want to spend a little bit of time on, because I think it gives really good context for the work that you do and the motivation for the work you do. I want to spend time on the fact that you're not just a revered scientist, you are also uh, a devout believer, you know, in a higher power, in God. Is it okay if we spend a little time talking about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Yeah, so, so, you know, Richard Dawkins, you know, emphasizes repeatedly that many adults who hold to a religious belief got it from their parents that it's sort of a it's passed down generation generation that certainly is not the case with you right no not the case at all uh, my parents late in life uh, became sort of believers my dad more than my mother but they certainly were not that way when i was growing up yeah and right. and so uh, what 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 was your journey then i mean was it at a very young age you had some experience or was it some of later on. Really, I mean, I did have experiences. I bet almost everybody does. Sort of those moments where they feel like there's something, something significant, some longing that you have for something bigger than what you can quite put into words. Uh, maybe it was a particular beautiful piece of music because I loved music from the time I uh, got started, and I found moments where listening to a particular symphony, I would be totally caught up in that, even to the point of tears and wondering, what is that all about? 
So beauty maybe as a, as a signal of some sort. But also I just felt while I was focused completely on physics and chemistry and I loved every bit of that, when I got to medical school, which is what came after my PhD training, I felt there was something missing here, especially as I sat at the bedside of good North Carolina people who were dying and who were able through their faith to make some sense out of it. And I couldn't. And I thought of myself in their position and I thought, I just I have no idea what they're talking about when these people are saying, I'm going to be OK because I have put my trust in Jesus. And I was like, what is that all about? And one afternoon, one of my patients who I had gotten up probably closer to than you're supposed to as a medical student, a grandmotherly sort of character, asked me point blank what I believed because she told me what she believed. And I realized I had absolutely no idea. At that point, I would have said I'm an atheist, but I also realized I've arrived at that position without really doing any work at all <laughs> to try to sort through the options and figure out why I've chosen that one, other than it's the one I kind of liked, because I didn't like the idea that I had to be responsible to anybody other than me. Yeah. And, and, and so in a sense, it was your scientific orientation that drove it in a sense, right? You're basically saying, I haven't interrogated this sufficiently to have a position. Exactly. And as a scientist, which I claim to be at that point, you're not supposed to make really important decisions without looking at the evidence. And I had to say to myself, you didn't do that. So, okay, better get busy, boy. And I assumed, Brian, that what I would then do would be to look at the pros and cons uh, for belief, and I would be very effective in strengthening my atheism. And to my surprise, it went the other way. Yeah. Uh, it took two years. This was not a simple like, you know, uh, all nighter where you kind of study what people believe about God and then it's all clear. And let me be clear, there's no proof of God's existence that I found, but I certainly found intriguing evidence and some of it within my own heart that ultimately forced me to say atheism just won't do for me. It's the denial of something. It's a universal negative claim, which scientists in general are supposed to avoid. And even within science itself, I saw things that I couldn't explain without some idea of a creator that set the universe in motion. There was a big bang. It all started somehow. Okay, that's hard to understand. The fine tuning of the universe, which <laughs> you know very well, where all of these constants that determine the behavior of matter and energy seem to have been set in a precise area where even a tiny tweak would make the whole thing just really not interesting at all without any possibility of complexity. That was a doozy for me, the so-called anthropic principle. We could talk about multiverses and that has to be the alternative there, but that also seemed to require a huge leap of faith and maybe still does. So little by little, bit by bit, and maybe again, reflecting back on those moments as a child and a young adult of that glimpse of something that you just longed to understand, longed to experience and couldn't quite put your finger on. And then ultimately for me, this question of morality and where does it come from? And if you're going to be a strict evolutionist, and I've had this argument with Richard Dawkins as recently as a month ago, and it'll be up in a podcast pretty soon. If you're going to be a strict evolutionist, you almost have to come to the conclusion that good and evil don't really have any fundamental basis. Uh, they're kind of in there as something that evolution has convinced us matter for our survival, but they don't really have any substance. And that's a really hard one to swallow. I could not swallow that. And if there's a source of morality that can't be explained on natural grounds, and if there's evidence for a creator based on all of these other insights, well, then maybe the creator is also the source of good and evil. And that means that's a God who cares about people. So not to necessarily recapitulate or, or step on the podcast of yours and Richard's that's coming up, and I, I don't know anything of it beyond your mention of it just now. It's interesting that you mentioned those two examples, sort of the Big Bang as a mystery, morality as a mystery. I, I wouldn't mind spending a, a moment talking about each of those sure. because I find it interesting that you don't look at the emergence of life as a mystery that rises to the level that would need to invoke a creator. And I suspect, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's because 
you understand it well enough. Like we still haven't been able to create life in the laboratory, but I think we understand the chemistry and the biology and the basic ideas well enough that we can see the trajectory that'll take us from here to there without intervention of any non-scientific principles. But for the Big Bang, you see it in a different category, I gather, because it rises to a place where you want to invoke a creator. Could that simply be a, a, a lack of understanding, not necessarily on your part, but just on, on the part of science? And, and this will be remedied at some point, and that argument will kind of fall the way of many God of the gaps type arguments. Yeah, that's fair, Brian. And on the other hand, I think if it does fall by the way, we'll still be left with the question of why is there something instead of nothing? Yes. Uh, and that's a really hard one to come up with a scientific answer to. If in fact there is a physical mechanism that allows uh, out of nothing or essentially nothing, a universe to come into being, 13.55 billion years ago. Okay, that doesn't tell me to be more in, uh, to be less in awe of the creator, but maybe yeah. more in awe of how there is something instead of nothing. What I see, and if you'll accept a premise, uh, people listening, of the idea that there might be a creator behind this, then the most awesome kind of creator would instill uh, within nature, within the universe, the potentiality of life, right down to the point of our having this conversation with full intention that that kind of blossoming of beauty and, and complexity uh, was part of the point. And if God is the creator that put this all in place, then God couldn't very well be limited in time. Otherwise, you've created an infinite regress and you have to explain how God was created. So God has to be outside of time and outside of space, in which case the idea of being able to put all of this sort of pregnant with potential at the very moment at the beginning of the universe is even more amazing than if it required supernatural intervention along the way, as some of the intelligent design folks seem to claim to be necessary. I am not a fan of intelligent design, sure. but I'm a fan of the creator and of evolutionary creation because the data supporting the fact that we are as living species all really related to each other through a common ancestor is yeah. overwhelming. And I think that's fantastic. That's even more amazing. I, I, I agree with that. It, you know, if, if one takes obviously the premise that there is something beyond the physical, and I guess the worry that 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 I have when I look, I'm asked all the time. Perhaps you know the second most frequent question I'm asked is, "What happened before the Big Bang?" The most frequent question is, "What's quantum entanglement?" And do you understand it? But that's for a different conversation. Uh, and, and so when people ask me what happened before the Big Bang. Obviously, I find myself potentially in that infinite regress, because if I actually speak of something that itself could have had a beginning, the question is, well, where did that come from? And so it feels to me that the religious answer just redefines the question by invoking a term God that stands outside by definition, the infinite regress. But I feel like I could use any word to do that. It didn't have to be a God-like term. D does, does that hold any issue for you thinking that in that setting? No, I hear what you're saying and you could invoke any other kind of term, but then you have these other aspects of what mm. we have within human experience. And I'll come back to morality and whether it actually has any meaning or not that compels me uh, to say, okay, maybe there's something more here than just an explanation from physics about how the universe got started. There's something about what it means to be human that maybe physics isn't quite answering and requires some other insight. And that's where I begin to follow the ideas that many others have put there long before me uh, that point to something that is not a deist kind of God, yep. but a theist kind of God that actually is interested in human beings. Right. So that does, that does naturally take us to the other part of the argument, the morality argument. And, and, and here, you know, it's interesting. So you made reference to it a moment ago in, in your conversation with, with Richard about this view that if you take evolutionary perspective or even a physicalist materialist perspective fully to heart, then good and evil and beauty and wonder and compassion and empathy and love, they have no grounding. Mm -hmm. They are, are just qualities that emerge that certain collections of particles are able to come up with and some live by it and some don't. 
And I have to say that is that is my my view. And and the thing that that I'm curious about is I find it potentially even more exalting, even more spectacular that a collection of particles called the human brain that emerge fully through evolution by natural selection is fully governed by the laws of physics. The fact that this highly organized collection of particles could come up with ideas of, of beauty and wonder and insight and compassion and ethics. We don't always live by these ideals, but the fact that this gloppy gray thing could come up with it feels to me even more exalting than putting those qualities at the feet of a, a divine presence who gave it to us. Do, 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 do you see what I'm saying there? I, I totally hear you, and uh, that's very much <laughs> what Richard would also say, having just had this conversation. But doesn't it bother you a little bit, then, that things that we as humans, down through the centuries, have considered fundamental about what it means to be human, particularly the fact that there is such a thing as good, and we're called to be good, and there's such a thing as evil, and we should avoid that 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 might actually be artificially created by those particles, by evolution. And it really means we've been hoodwinked. There's, there's nothing underneath that. that. I find that deeply troubling. It's so interesting because I don't find that the slightest bit troubling. And I'm not doing that to play devil's advocate or, or you know, just be a combatant in a conversation. To me, the universe is just ingredients governed by the physical laws that you and I know well from quantum mechanics and the various flavors of the laws that have been put forward in that way. And to me, there is nothing else. And so I stand in awe of the fact that without anything else, these wondrous things can happen that can yield Beethoven's Ninth Symphony or that can yield the Mona Lisa. It can also yield tragic qualities of the world and we're witnessing that today as we sit here right now but the fact that particles can yield such wondrous ideas without anything else we don't have to place the burden on something else or look to something outside of ourselves for the origin to me makes these ideas even more in need of reverence than if they did come from a religious force I get that with a lot of the elegance and complexity of the universe, because uh, I see that as a manifestation of what was put in place at the very beginning uh, of creation by whatever means, sure. And I, I can say that I admire today's sunset, uh, which was particularly beautiful, and that, that touched me in some way. At the same time, I know exactly why it is that those colors appeared as a consequence of the laws of physics. It's when it comes to good and evil that I am still troubled by simply dismissing that as a purely materialistic outcome of an evolutionary process. But I admit I'm also influenced here by my own particular faith, um, which mm. does include not just some sort of theistic ideas, but a very specific version of faith, which I arrived at kicking and screaming over two years <laughs> Uh, basically encountering the person of Jesus Christ, uh, which I found impossible to dismiss and who claimed not just to be a wise master and a thoughtful teacher, but actually to be connected as the son of God. And that's an outrageous claim that could not be accepted without an awful lot of evidence. And yet the evidence is pretty compelling by those who wrote about his time here. And who, um, by the report of eyewitnesses, not just was on the planet, but actually was crucified and then was resurrected. And people look at me as a scientist and say, well, you can't possibly believe that. But go with me a minute. If, if there is the possibility of God who cares about humanity, a theist God, who wants humanity somehow to strive for the good and to reject the evil, then why would that God not also be capable of appearing as a person on the planet for a time to teach us a lot of important things and even to sacrifice in the most brutal imaginable way to somehow make up for the price that we should have paid for all of our behaviors. I found that as a child to be just bogus, crazy. What are you talking about? And now I found it to be incredibly compelling truth. So my faith as 
based solely on the kind of conversation we're having about nature and morality would be okay, but it gets a lot more specific when it comes to this particular kind of faith of Christianity and the person of Jesus. And, 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 and you know, I am not one of those scientists or, or thinkers who says, how could you hold to that perspective at all? I think it's obvious that one can hold that perspective if you view science as a body of truth and insight into some qualities of the world, but not every quality of the world. And, and once you allow for it to be a, just a subset, if there are things that are beyond the reach of physical law, then those qualities could be radically different from anything that we're familiar with or that we've experienced. At the same time, what would hold me back, and I'm wondering how you, you view it, can you envision any experience or, or any insight from any source that would convince you that you're not right, that, that Jesus is not who you thought he is, or that your faith was misplaced in your earlier version of your, your younger self who, who saw it as, as bogus was, was correct? Yes, absolutely. Uh, if uh, there was a credible uh, evidence-based discovery of the bones of Jesus uh, somewhere in a crypt uh, in Israel, uh, then my faith would utterly fall apart. It would. So you would not find some other poetic, metaphorical interpretation. The bones are there, but the spirit left. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It, wouldn't, it would no longer be credible. I would have to abandon it. Absolutely. And, and do you stand in any kind of fear of that happening or you just have a, you've, you've interrogated the evidence sufficiently that you feel you're on solid ground? I as solid it. as one can be. But you know, faith is not something, at least for me, that's associated with absolute confidence. It, doubt is a big part of my faith. And I think a big part of most people's faith. Uh, otherwise, you're not being totally honest with yourself. But Brian, I think the difference between you and me could be put in sort of a Bayesian calculation uh, my prior probability of there being a creator God is, is not huge, but it's not zero. Yours is zero. <laughs> and if you've stepped into every situation with that prior of zero, you're going to find some other way to explain the observations, whether it's fine tuning of the universe or the person of Jesus. Where for me, I came into it after that medical school experience saying, OK, let's allow the prior not to be zero anymore. <laughs> Let's see what kinds of things fit into that. And to my surprise, it took me somewhere that I found to be deeply meaningful. Right. And, and, and just, just, just for the record, for me, the prior, if we're talking Bayesian for a second, is, is not actually zero. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say it's small and it's sufficiently small that if I do a Bayesian-like calculation, I still come down on physicalist, materialist explanations for, for all of the mysteries that, that I've ever encountered. So, so what would change your mind? You asked me that question. What would very, cause Ryan Green to say, okay, I get it. God, you are real and you care about me. It's a, it's a great question. It's a very hard one to answer because I could throw out ideas and in other conversations I've flippantly said things like, if the clouds parted and you know, the face came down and said, here I am, you know, that, that would be convincing. But then I said to myself, would I really be convinced or would I check myself in a Bellevue hospital and, and think of a more, you, you, you know, so, so I don't have a full answer to that question, but I will say that I'm open to the possibility. Whereas I know that many of my colleagues are simply not their prior is zero and will always be zero and, and <laughs> will never change. And I don't have that sort of dogmatic stance. You, you know the famous, you know the famous Bertrand Russell story uh, that uh, somebody asked Bertrand. So suppose you actually die, and you go to heaven, and there's God saying, uh, "You know, Bertrand, why were you so against me? Why didn't you believe in me?" And Russell says, "Sorry, God, not enough evidence." <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Uh, so I think at that point it would be enough evidence. For me, just to say, but but when it comes to religious texts, obviously some people watching this conversation will say, "But look, there are places where science and religion are just at loggerheads. They just cannot blend together." Now, my view on that has always been: if you take a poetic or metaphorical stance when it comes to religious texts, 
then using an interpretive schema, you can make everything blend together. Do, do you hold to that view? And, and like, is there a place where you draw the line? There must be where you say poetry and metaphor, okay, in this part of religion, but not in this part. Certainly, when I look at the Bible, it's important to see what kind of language is being used here and who is the audience that this particular uh, book of the Bible was written for. A lot of the trouble seems to arise in Genesis 1 and 2 about creation. But read John Walton, who's an uh, Old Testament theologian at Wheaton College, which is a pretty darn conservative Christian place, about what it was that Genesis 1 and 2 would have meant to the original readers. It was not intended as a science textbook. It was not even clear that they were talking about days of creation in the specific sense of physical days, but more of a metaphor of building a temple. It's a wonderful book, and it really helped me see so many ways in which this, over the course of many centuries, has led people into directions that weren't really called for. I mean, you go back to St. Augustine in 400 AD, who was obsessed by Genesis and ultimately said, I can't figure out what is intended here and let nobody pretend that they know the answer and then make Christians out to look stupid because they turn out to be scientifically wrong. Well, here yeah. we are. That's kind of happened. So I, you know, I became a Christian at age 27. I was already deeply interested in genetics. People said, your head's going to explode. This is not going to be compatible. It's never happened, Brian. Yeah. You know, more than 40 years later, I've never seen an instance where my insistence as a scientist for the most rigorous evidence, if you're gonna tell me something about nature, you better show me what your data looks like, uh, to conflict with what I know as a person of faith. It's just, you gotta be careful about which question are you asking and which approach makes sense. But I'm not a fan of the Stephen Jay Gould idea of non-overlapping magisteriality, that you have magisteria, you have to keep these yeah. somehow separate with a big firewall. They're not a firewall in my experience in yeah. any given day. I wake up, I read the Bible, I do a scientific data analysis, I read a paper, try to come up with some sort of decision about a new project. It all fits together. It's all part of God's creation. And so, but, so when it comes to Genesis 1 and 2, metaphor, poetry, interpretive schema works well. But, but you are saying that when it comes to say, just to be concrete, the resurrection is not metaphor. It's not yes. poetry. Yes. Well, read read the words, and this does not read like poetry. This reads like history written by eyewitnesses of events that happened, that were dramatic, uh, that were written down with great care, that leave really not much room for you to say, oh, that was just somebody's emotional experience. <laughs> There's some emotional experience, to be sure, but it is written as eyewitness history, and you can't discount that and just walk away from it as if it didn't matter. People have tried, I can't seem to do that. And so when it does come to your work, say in genetics, if we can turn to that now, that presumably is something which, again, you're saying you don't see a firewall, you don't need a firewall between that work and religious perspective. But when you go to the lab, you're using the traditional tools approach that, that of course every other scientist is using. When did you start? work in genetics? Presumably it was a good deal before the, the Human Genome Project. It was when I was a graduate student studying quantum mechanics uh, that I discovered that I'd narrowed my horizons a bit prematurely by discounting biology because it just seemed way too messy. I bet you would resonate with that. because That was really my messy. attitude. Now I wonder if like maybe I should have had a more open mind. But anyway, this is your, <laughs> your story, not mine. Uh, yeah, but you know, I was in a department of chemistry and there were actually people in that department studying DNA. And uh, when I heard what they were doing, it perked me up. I was like, wow, that's really, you really, that's how it works. I had ignored all of this and it felt like a real calling. If I'm going to put my life into science, I want to do something that maybe could make a difference. And quantum mechanics would do that as well. But this just seemed to be so pregnant with possibilities. This was like 1973, recombinant DNA was being invented. So that's what lured me away uh, off to medical school uh, to try to see, could I learn that science and could I apply it uh, to better? And, and why medical school as opposed to like, like you know, postdoc in biology or something? Well, that was a hard decision because it meant a lot more years of yeah. training. I will tell you, Brian, I had kind of lost my own sense of confidence about whether I was really cut out to be a researcher 
uh, sort of recognizing that I'd been on this very narrow perspective. I'm going to be a quantum mechanics expert. And then realizing maybe that's not my calling anymore. What am I going to do? So maybe I should try to kind of keep some options open here. And if I'm not going to be a researcher, maybe I could be a doctor. Why that argument got me admitted to the University of North Carolina Medical School could be debated because it wasn't a very compelling way to say why I wanted to be a physician, which I'd never really thought about until I was like 22. And so, you, so your research took you to ultimately genetic studies of, of various human afflictions. Um, what, what did you focus on in, in, the, in the earlier part of that work? Well, I spent eight years learning how to be a doctor. And I really tried to throw myself into that. And I encountered many instances as a guy interested in genetics where there were these really terrible diseases that nobody understood other than to say they were inherited. You didn't really know why or how or what you should do for them. So that seemed like something maybe I could bring together my love of science and my love of medicine and find some answers. So once I finally got through all that training and ended up as a assistant professor at the University of Michigan, I focused on trying to find the genetic glitches that cause diseases like Huntington's disease and cystic mm. fibrosis. And it was hard back then. There was no genome to just uh, look up on the internet because there was no internet. And, and so sifting your way uh, through uncharted territory, which is most of the genome, trying to find what might be one letter out of three billion that was misspelled was brutal. And many people thought, this is hopeless. This is never going to work. And it took many years and a lot of burned out people along the way. But I learned to collaborate when you couldn't figure something out yourself, find somebody else who has a complementary approach. And the big moment for me where I really believed this could work uh, was finding the cystic fibrosis gene in 1989, a discovery which 30 years later has now led to the fact that most people with cystic fibrosis, 90% of them have a really effective treatment that's allowing them not to think about their next hospitalization, but about maybe what they'll do when they retire. That's and that was, a, that was a single letter, I guess, that is Three, actually, okay. yeah. Okay. CTT that's deleted in most people with cystic fibrosis in a gene that nobody had discovered before. But I also thought at the time, okay, we got there, but this was incredibly stressful and painful and took way too long. And cystic fibrosis should have been one of the easy ones. It's relatively common. It's very well uh, understood in terms of its inheritance. What about the thousands of other hereditary conditions? We've got to have a better way to do this. And that was a big motivation for the Genome Project, which I then got very involved in. And so when people, I guess with your experience, trying to find you know, individual letters that, that might be responsible for or this or that disease, when people began to talk about sequencing the entire human genome, was that something that the field basically said we'll be able to do this yes no. or was it no yeah yeah no go back and read some of the commentaries in 1989 and 1990 most of the scientific community was opposed to the human genome project as being uh, absolutely foolhardy it'll never work the technology will never mature to the point of being able to read that many letters of the code uh, it'll cost way too much money which will be siphoned away from more useful things and by the way, this was the most troubling one. Only mediocre people will want to work on it because it's so boring. <laughs> it's like, come on, I want to work on it. I don't think I'm mediocre. Give me a break here. And, and, and all wrong. <laughs> and, and, and so I guess Jim Watson was the initial leader. Uh, is, that, is that in my memory correct on that? You have that right. And Jim, as the rock star of science, uh, got the Congress of the United States interested in actually supporting this, which was important. And then by alienating almost everybody by the fact that Jim is not somebody who's careful about what he says, uh, disappeared rather quickly from the leadership. And uh, then a new leader had to be found. Uh, we were all terrified about what that meant. And to my surprise, it turned out to be me. And, and did you immediately jump at that? Oh, no. Or did you have your own reservations about taking that? I had out? deep reservations. I was a faculty member at the University of Michigan. I was supported by Howard Hughes. I had this perfect life that I had hoped for of teaching medical students, which I enjoy, seeing patients and running a research lab. And we were on the trail of all kinds of interesting uh, detective stories. And this meant what? Giving all that up and becoming a federal employee <laughs> to run a, a government program? Uh, I said, no, 
um, for the first few months. And then eventually, you know, Brian, you get asked once in your life to do something that really is not what you were expecting. This door opens, but it's running the genome project and you're going to walk away from it because it's not convenient. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's high risk, high reward. Oh, yeah. Uh, is the possibility there? If you don't mind my asking, since we just discussed faith earlier on, in facing a decision like that, does faith play a role in your personal life to figuring out what to do? Oh, yeah. I, every time I've had a big decision, I have tried to find a place uh, to be set aside uh, without distractions, a retreat of some sort. Um, for that decision, I spent a very long day in a little chapel in uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where my daughter was at that point a uh, undergraduate, or maybe she was a medical student by then, just on my knees trying to figure out what was this a calling or, or was this really something that was a distraction that was not going to turn out well. And at the end of that long day, somehow even song uh, occurred in that chapel, which I hadn't expected. I, I took part in it and it felt like I had peace that mm. this, is, this is something I should do. And so you, 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 you took the helm of the Human Genome Project, and I guess it wasn't too long after that some competition cropped up from, <laughs> from the private sector, uh, Craig Venter and, and, and his, his approach. And, and, and I, the question I have for you there is, was that competition driven by wanting to be first to get this result or was it i guess the other side of it was there was an there was a threat at some level that the results could be patented and, and kept from from the public was it a blend of those two that 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 drove you on the competition front it was more the latter to be honest yeah. Uh, Craig had been part of the public effort. Uh, he was funded by the Genome Project through the NIH for the first few years. And then he stepped aside from that, started this company called Solera, and uh, aimed to try uh, to beat the government effort by getting there first, and made it very clear that he intended uh, to recoup the investment of his stockholders uh, by claiming ownership uh, of the DNA sequence, our shared inheritance. That was anathema uh, to all of us who'd worked in the public project and were giving the sequence away every 24 hours. That was our goal. And so it very much became not so much a race about who's got better technology. We were using the same technology. Uh, it became a race about whether this is going to be a commodity or whether this is going to be in the public domain. And certainly many of us felt very strongly about that. Ultimately, I mean, he did a credible job. He was using all the public data because it was public <laughs> and yeah. adding some of his own to it. But the public data was good enough uh, to generate a really good version of the Human Genome Project by the summer of 2000, when there was this announcement that a draft was in hand. And shortly after that, the private sector folded because there was no reason for that to continue. There was not going to be a product there that they could claim. It was already out there in the public domain. It was a good outcome. And, and so was the competition, in your view, in retrospect, was it a good thing that there was competition to, to sort you know, of put? I think it, it probably was. It got everybody's adrenaline going. <laughs> People were working really hard. They worked even harder then to be sure that this wasn't something that ended up out of reach uh, for the average member of our human species. And it got more public attention because up until the point that there was this so-called race for the genome, most people didn't even know it was happening. And now all of a sudden, oh, this guy has a yacht and that guy rides a motorcycle and it became People Magazine and it got attention. And I, I gather you were the motorcycle, that. not the yacht. Is that, is that <laughs> I had the motorcycle, yes. And, and some of it was ridiculous, but at least it got public interest. Like, oh, what is this? Is this going to make a difference? Maybe this is something to pay attention to. And they did. And you, you kind of famously in, in describing the result, blended your personal faith in terms of a description. I guess you've described the human genome as, as, as God's instruction manual for life or somewhere in that, that combination of words. Is that how you do see it? 
I did. Again, not that I saw that God had sort of reached in here and written out the ACs, Gs, and Ts, but as we talked about earlier, that in my view, God the Creator made it possible through the natural laws that I also think God was behind. God is the greatest physicist and the greatest mathematician for a universe to come into being that would lead to this moment where for the first time, a big brain species was able to read their own instruction book. That's pretty breathtaking. But but you you also do not describe yourself as a deist, I gather. You, you don't, or maybe in part you do, you know, some would say God set everything up at the get-go, receded back and allowed the laws of physics to cause the universe to expand, collections of particles to coalesce into atoms and molecules. I mean, ultimately, when we talk about the genetic code, it's four letters, three billion letters long, but each of those letters is a stand-in for a very specific molecule, which is a collection of very specific atoms held together by very specific forces. You don't think that God's interceding in those details is that is that no, right no god is much more awesome than that <laughs> god put this all in place so that that would be the inevitable outcome of what started uh, more than 13 billion years ago but it's not a deist god who then got bored and went on to do something else again coming back to my faith god is interested in us god cares about good and evil god actually came to join us for a few brief, brief years in the person of Jesus. That's a theist God if there ever was one. But why would God make things so complicated? <laughs> I mean, as a physicist, the laws of nature, I, I do see have a simplicity and elegance, uh, of course, but the, the richness of the world that emerges from that, it's a very complicated process. And you could imagine that if God wanted things to turn out a particular way, there might have been a simpler approach. Does that not suggest to you that maybe it wasn't that kind of intelligent designer behind it all? No, I don't see it that way. I think what we see in terms of the incredible complexity is part of the gift because complexity also means beauty in many ways. It makes it more interesting. Sure, if God wanted to create a universe where everything was clockwork and if there were any intelligent beings, they were all sort of automatically wired uh, to worship God from the moment they were born. I guess God could have done that, but it wouldn't have been very interesting. God seems to be interested in us and giving us that kind of free will to figure out what we make of all of this. And I think that's a much more intriguing kind of creation than something that might have been simpler, but maybe not so much worth God's time. Right. And so with the human genome sequenced, how do you feel about how that data has been used so far? Are we are we further along than you would have hoped by this stage? Not as far along? In different areas, it may be uh, one or the other of that. I certainly think in terms of our ability now to be able to use genomics in research, it's been profound. Uh, my own lab studies uh, two diseases. One is type 2 diabetes, a common cause, unfortunately, of uh, much suffering. And the other, a very rare disease, progeria, which yeah. causes premature aging. We couldn't have done any of that without the offspring of the Human Genome Project and the ability to be able to look at uh, DNA samples in a blink of an eye, practically, and ask what's there. And now to look at that at a single cell and ask what that cell, what it's doing. Omics is everywhere. Graduate students today in any area of biology simply cannot imagine how we did anything useful before we had the Genome Project and all of its spinoffs. So research, utterly transformed. A clinical practice, cancer, utterly transformed. Uh, cancer mm -hmm. is a disease of the genome. Now, most people in the developed world, if you develop cancer, that kind of set of tools is going to be used to help figure out which therapy is most likely to help you. And that's a big step forward. It's certainly turning out to be incredibly valuable in figuring out all kinds of dilemmas in terms of diagnoses that people haven't been able to arrive at uh, for young children, where you know there's something yeah. not right. Now, the, the really method of choice, sequence the genome, see if you can figure out what's going on there, and sometimes save four or five years of diagnostic odysseys that lead you almost nowhere. 
That's yeah. all transforming more and more, uh, certainly in infectious disease. Look with COVID, the spinoff of the genome project to be able to rapidly sequence viral genomes has led us to the ability to be able to track a pandemic in record speed and, yeah. and to discover new variants just as soon as they start to appear. All of that's happening and all of that is incredibly gratifying. Has it transformed the average person's medical care? Not really in the way I wish it would. We have ways to go, particularly when it comes to prevention. That's something that we really wanted to see that your individual genome ought to allow a more precision approach to prevention instead of one size fits all. This program that we're running called All of Us in the US, which is enrolling a million people in a prospective longitudinal study where complete genome sequence and electronic health records and all kinds of environmental exposures are being melded together is going to get us a lot closer to that. And programs like the UK Biobank in, in Britain and programs in Australia that have this same idea, we're going to get there. But that takes really big data sets, probably a lot of machine learning in order to sift through the complexities of the human body, which is, yeah. as you said earlier, maybe God could have made this a little simpler, but it's what we got. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in the remaining time that we have, I wanted to turn to the new job that you mentioned oh, yes. before that you've now taken on, uh, President Biden's science advisor. And with all of the challenges that we face in the world and all the opportunities that we have, so many of them have a scientific base, a science, science at their core, from what we're talking now in terms of medicine, personalized medicine, alternate energy issues of climate change, global pandemics, of course. Look, nuclear weapons and war is sort of back on the table in a, in a shocking way in recent times. Where do you see the role of someone with your background who perhaps may have a much closer line to the ear of the president of the United States. What, what role do you see for yourself there? Well, I didn't expect this role and I'm right now on my 18th day. Uh, so I'm still sorting out exactly how I can best play this role. But we are fortunate in the US right now to have a president who cares deeply about science and who is really interested in getting that kind of information on every topic. Uh, hungry to see the way in which that kind of science-based, evidence-based decision-making can result in a better outcome. And so I'm finding myself very much called upon. And it is certainly, as you said, it's not just about my areas that I'd be more familiar with in biomedicine. It's also about many other aspects where science is critical. Um, we're having a meeting a day after tomorrow on, on fusion and whether there's a advance uh, or a set of advances that might be possible here uh, to deal with our energy demands. And of course, climate crisis, uh, which we are way behind on where we should be uh, in terms of dealing uh, with global warming and what are the things that can be done that are going to require international input. So yes, uh, my horizons got vastly enlarged as a result of doing this. And they were already pretty enlarged serving as the NIH director for 12 years, but this yeah. takes me into a whole lot of other areas. And I'm kind of glad that I had that background in physics and chemistry because it's now becoming really relevant. And, and we scientists, I think as many people watching this know, we are a global community from the get-go, right? I yes. mean, our colleagues were constantly talking to people in other universities and other countries around the world. And so we have this international language that we speak from the moment we walk into the laboratory. To what extent does that allow you to play a role that can unify a world that's fractured? I mean, I've heard, and, and, and I'm just wondering if this is true, I've heard that science advisors from many different countries around the world have a sort of below the radar meeting, meeting, set of meetings where like behind the scenes, because you all know how to talk to each other across international lines. Is that is that true? Is that part of it? And, and how do you see the more general idea of trying to smooth out these global fractures? It's totally true, although I will deny it if somebody <laughs> asks me the details. Uh, and you would want it to be true. Yeah, science has this a wonderful tradition. What was it? Pasteur said, science knows no country. It is the torch that illuminates the world. We need that torch to burn even more brightly right now with all the fracturing that's happened in relationships. And scientists, I think, have 
invested in those relationships over the years. And we can build on that because we've learned how to trust each other and to tell each other the truth about facts and evidence. That's what science is all about. If, if we needed those international connections in the past, we need them even more now. And I do see that as something that I might be able to help with. The Genome Project, of course, was totally international. Almost everything I've worked on that really mattered, whether it was the microbiome or the cancer genome, uh, have always found its way into an international collaboration. And that's how the work got done, with everybody agreeing to help each other and to make the data accessible so that progress could happen. That's what we need to do even more of now. And uh, do you think there need, should be more scientists who step into public life through government or other, other means? Brian, I'm glad you asked. I certainly do. I've been greatly benefited and privileged uh, to serve in these roles with the Genome Project, with the NIH directorship, and now in this role with the president. It is not a way to make a lot of money, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but you know, ultimately, I don't think that's really what, when it comes to the end of your life, you're going to look back on and say that's what mattered. David Brooks has this wonderful comparison about what it is that people are trying to achieve. Is it resume virtues or is it eulogy virtues? It's the eulogy virtues I think most of us ultimately wish that we had invested in. Public service is a great <laughs> eulogy virtue. You basically decide to give of yourself to make the world a better place. And right now, science is one of the strongest ways to get there. It's a little daunting because science is, as you have seen, a bit under attack right now. Yeah. Certainly in the United States and probably in lots of parts of the world, there's such polarization, such divisiveness and politics finds its way into discussions where it doesn't belong. And science in many ways gets caught up in that. And scientists who are giving out with valuable evidence-based information get demonized uh, because people didn't want to hear it. So you know, all the more reason why I think scientists do need to be courageous and to be out there in the public sphere, telling the world what the facts are of the matter in an interpretable winsome, uh, believable way, but not hiding in the lab. We've got to be out there. We're part of the solution to the terrible situation our world seems to be in. And any chance of Francis Collins 2028? <laughs> okay, my prior on that is zero. <laughs> Less chance than there's God. I love that. Um, well, Francis, it's been a delight speaking with you. And, um, you know, a, a wonderful blend of uh, big ideas and ideas that matter to us on a scientific level and a deeply human level. And best of luck in the new undertaking. And we can only all hope that you'll have great impact on shifting policy in a way that really makes sense for all of humanity. So if you can push us at all in that direction, God bless you. Brian, thank you so much. It's been a real privilege to talk with you. Thank you for your leadership of this World Science Festival over what I guess is now about 13 or 14 years. Yeah, I don't like to think about how many years it is, but I had different color hair back then. So, yeah, and more of it. That's how it goes. <laughs> so, so thanks again and look forward to crossing paths sometime in the future. And to all of you who are watching, thank you so much for joining this World Science Festival conversation. And you should subscribe to the World Science Festival newsletter, the World Science Festival YouTube page as well. We are going to be releasing a number of programs in even the coming weeks. Just a little preview. We'll have a program on quantum mechanics, a program on longevity, a program on the brain is coming up. I can't even remember all the other ones that are going to be coming out. But roughly every two, three weeks, we should now be providing some really interesting conversations at the cutting edge of a variety of sciences. So you can look forward to that. So again, thank you so much for joining us and looking forward to seeing you at the next of these World Science Festival conversations.